Um, I'm going to tell you today like um, what challenges we will face in cryptography with uh, quantum computers and how we will encrypt after quantum computers, how we will encrypt tomorrow. So a uh, very quick introduction. Um, I'm Hanno Böck. I uh, work both as a freelance journalist and I like to say as a hacker because I don't really like the term security researcher. Um, I occasionally write for the German news magazine Golem and various other publications. Um, and I run the Fuzzing Project, which is uh, an attempt to improve the security of free and open source software. And I'm also the author of a monthly newsletter about TLS. Um, okay, so um, the story about quantum computers begins in 1982 when uh, Richard Feynman uh, had the idea that you may be able to use certain effects in quantum mechanics to do some calculations faster than you could do them with a classical computer. Now, Feynman didn't think any about cryptography. He uh, mainly had in mind to use this to be able to simulate certain things in physics that were very hard to simulate on normal computers because they were just too computationally expensive. Um, but then in 1994, uh, Peter Shore uh, found out that you could use these quantum computers, if you had one, uh, to break public key encryption because he found an algorithm that allowed factoring large numbers and calculating discrete logarithms. Um, so uh, a quantum computer is, in general, it, it's a theoretical device. We don't have them today. Um, the theory is, as far as I understand, well understood. So it's based on well understood quantum mechanics, um, but they are very hard to build in practice because you need to have a very tight control over single particles that are entangled. So, uh, so currently we cannot build quantum computers, but uh, we may be able in the future. And uh, what is a, a, a bit, uh, what I have observed is that the predictions tend to get lower. So if you ask researchers who are active in this field today, they may say you things like, okay, maybe in 10 or 15 years, we will be able to build a quantum computer. And that, that's a very different tone than you had a couple of years ago when they often said, oh, maybe this will never be possible. And uh, so this seems to be something that at least uh, for some people, they have, they have the estimation that this is not extremely far away. Um, and uh, post-quantum cryptography is, uh, to summarize it, it's just uh, cryptographic algorithms where we believe that they are uh, resistant to attacks with a quantum computer. And the development of those is st still in early stages. Um, so um, the easy part is the symmetric encryption. So if you have uh, cryptographic algorithms where you have one key for encryption and decryption, for example, AES, or also if you have a hash function, which you use as a building block in many situations in cryptography. Um, and there are also quantum algorithms that reduce the security of those, but they are not so powerful. So. Uh, the general recommendation here is if you just use a large enough key, then you're safe. Then you can protect yourself against a quantum computer. And uh, for a normal uh, symmetric cipher, 256 bits is more than enough. Uh, so that part we can handle relatively easy. Um, and then there's public key cryptography. Uh, so public key cryptography essentially includes three mechanisms. One is like uh, encrypting with a separate private and public key, which you may know if you use PGP or something like that. Um, it's also like digital signatures and it's also key exchanges, which we usually use for things like TLS or SSH. Um, and um, basically all the public key crypto that we use today is based on one of three problems. Uh, one of them is factoring. Uh, that means like I have a very large number that's the product of two large primes. And if an attacker can find these two primes, he can break the key. Um, the other one is discrete logarithm. Um, 
and the third one is elliptic curve discrete logarithm. So we, uh, this is important to understand that like the public key cryptography we use today, uh, we don't have that many alternatives. We only have these three mechanisms and also they are all relatively re closely related. So the, uh, the, uh, the attacks on them, like many algorithms can be used, like many attack algorithms can be used to attack all of them or uh, at least two of them. So uh, what we need to understand is our public key cryptography is uh, based on very few foundations. And the important thing when we talk about post-quantum crypto, all of those get broken by quantum computers. So that means like everything we use today is broken. So uh, that affects uh, basically almost every cryptographic software out there it affects protocols like TLS, SSH, it affects uh, email encryption like uh, GNU-PG, it affects messaging apps like Signal, or WhatsApp, uh, OTR, or Mimo, whatever. Uh, everything that's uh, mainstream used today gets broken. Um, so um, there's, there are some candidates for uh, problems that we could use to build post-quantum crypto systems. I have listed them here. Um, so that's code-based cryptography, lattice-based cryptography, isogeny-based cryptography, which is some very new thing, hash-based signatures, and multivariate cryptography, which is, uh, I wasn't really sure to, if to include it because it's not really, there's, uh, I, I don't think, there's no current research going on on that, but um, it was considered in the past. Um, so, if you say, like today, you want to have something that's really safe and is even safe against a quantum computer, then there are some recommendations from an EU research project, uh, which is led by Tanja Lange from the University of Eindhoven. Um, and if you look into this uh, for encryption, the, this document recommends to use an algorithm called McElise, um, which belongs to something called code-based encryption. I won't go into the details or of these algorithms, like how they are built, uh, also because I don't, uh, I don't understand the details myself, but I, I'm only giving you like a high level view. Um, and uh, there's a paper from 2013, uh, which is a MacBits paper, where they recommend uh, key sizes and parameters for this algorithm. Um, and what's good about this algorithm is that it, it's, it's quite old. I think it originates from the 70s, so there has already been quite a bit of research on it. Um, what's kind of bad is uh, you need very large keys. So if you use this, uh, these recommendations, you end up having a key that's about one megabyte in size. And you can easily imagine uh, that may work if you do email encryption, but it won't work if you do TLS because if you, transmit, if you have to transmit one megabyte before you can access a web page, that's not feasible. Um, then there are uh, hash-based signatures. Uh, so what is good about them is that you're building your security among, uh, upon hash functions, and hash functions are very well understood construction, so we, have relatively con we are relatively confident in their security. So, and we can say, okay, this signature scheme is as secure as this hash, hash function. Um, and there's an algorithm called XMSS, which uh, is currently in the standardization process. So there's a draft in the IETF, and there will probably soon be an RFC. Um, the problem with that one is that it has an internal state. So if you're signing messages, you need to like, keep some internal value and change that with each signature. And that's, uh, that's difficult to handle in many situations. For example, if you have two servers, they cannot share the key unless they have some mechanism to also synchronize their state, or you cannot like freeze a VM and then restart it two times, or things like that. Um, and so, and therefore there's a kind of a, a newer algorithm which is called Sphinx, which uh, eliminates the state um, this is from their web page. Um, and, but the problem with that is uh, it has quite large signatures, uh, which are in the range of 40 kilobytes. Now, you might say 40 kilobytes, okay, maybe the, it's bigger, but it's not that much, but it is a whole lot. If you look at a TLS handshake these days, you will find out that 
you have in the range of like eight signatures that you're transmitting in a handshake. Um, so uh, if you have uh, 40 kilobytes times eight and you just need that for a handshake, you will easily see that this is also not very practical. Um, and uh, now th these were like the safe choices. If you want to have something where we have relatively high confidence that it will stay secure, and now we're getting to the maybe uh, a bit more experimental choices. And uh, a likely candidate for post-quantum cryptography is uh, lattice-based cryptosystems. Uh, they have been around for a while. There's an algorithm called Entru, which uh, I, I think is, is, uh, was already developed in the 90s, but it never really caught on. Uh, and the main reason for that is that there's a patent on it. Um, and then there are some newer algorithms based on something called ring learning with errors. And one algorithm is called New Hope that's based on ring learning with errors. Uh, which is currently a lot of people look at that right now and uh, think about implementing that. Um, and there's Entru Prime, which is from uh, Dan Bernstein and Tanya Lange. And uh, Bliss and Tesla Sharp, these are signature schemes on lattices. So lattices you can use for both encryption, key exchanges, and for signatures. Um, and this is much more practical. So, for example, for New Hope, you have to transmit six kilobytes to do a key exchange. That's still more than we did in the past. Like at Diffie-Hellman, it's maximum 512 bytes. So, uh, but it's, you can handle that. It, it's, one can work with that. Um, but uh, I mean, the, the biggest problem there is that there's still like a, a lot of uh, scientific conflict about how secure are these schemes really? Uh, can we trust the security estimates on them? Um, but these are, uh, I would, these are the most likely candidates of crypto schemes that we will use uh, in the not so far future. Um, and then there is something called super singular isogenies of elliptic curves, which um, the rough understanding is so, um, I mean, people already, if they hear elliptic curves, they think this is super complicated and this is like even more complicated. Uh, um, the, the basic idea is that an isogeny is kind of a transformation from one elliptic curve to another one. Um, and there's an algorithm uh, um, which is uh, very similar to a Diffie-Hellman exchange, which makes it kind of attractive. You could say, okay, we know how Diffie-Hellman works and this is kind of similar, so we can work with this. Um, and it has relatively small keys, uh, but it, it's very slow. And, but the biggest problem is like, uh, it's even more experimental than lattices. So this is all quite new and uh, there are papers all the time like uh, what, what you have to consider and uh, that you have to do certain checks so it gets secure and yeah. So very experimental but maybe an option for the future. Um, so kind of the summary of this is that if you want to use post-quantum cryptography today, we have the choice between something that is very impractical or something that's very experimental. Um, now, some things about what we have to consider when we want to implement these things. Um, what we saw in the past years is that we had a lot of attacks on very old crypto. Uh, for example, like the logjam attack and the freak attack, these were basically downgrades on export cryptography, which was mandated in the 90s due to some laws that disallowed exporting strong crypto. Um, and we had Drown, which was against SSL version two, which was the very first version of SSL developed by Netscape in the 90s. Um, and we had Suite 32, which is uh, against uh, block ciphers with a small block size. So what we're seeing is, okay, there are attacks against very old crypto. So it seems we are not getting rid of very old crypto. Uh, so it, it's really hard to deprecate stuff. Uh, and there, there's a sizable number of people who, who still have to consider that many of their website visitors are using Windows XP. Because it, like in some countries, it, it has a, a significant market share. Um, so you need to somehow re remain compatible with very old operating systems. Um, and if the predictions become true that in 10 to 15 years we have a quantum computer, then 
we can say, we can be pretty sure that the transition to post quantum schemes will be very rough. Um, and what we also have to consider, like even if you have a secure algorithm, that doesn't mean that our crypto system is secure. There, there are often many details to consider and, and I think something that illustrates this very well is that just last month we had three papers on how to choose Diffie-Hellman parameters. Now Diffie-Hellman is the oldest public key encryption system at all. It comes from the 70s and now he, here we are in 2016 and we're still debating how to properly use this algorithm. So, um, and we will have similar problems with these new encryption schemes, obviously. Um, and um, this is a bit scary. So uh, we could say, okay, even these quantum computers are 10, 15 years uh, uh, in the future, uh, but uh, maybe this is already a problem today because we could imagine an attacker that just stores all the data he can get, like the encrypted data, hard disks are cheap, I don't know, put them in the basement, and uh, when a quantum computer gets available, he can decrypt all the old data. And you can ask yourself, if you're sending an email with very sensitive content and you're a security person, so you know how to use PGP, unlike all the other people, so you're using PGP, um, do you want that to be, uh, do you want an attacker to be able to decrypt that in 20 years? That may be uncomfortable or maybe even 10 years. Um, so this is, uh, I think, a very strong argument that we should really try to deploy these things fast. Um, and uh, one thing people are looking at right now is uh, that we could use hybrid modes, which means like, uh, okay, maybe we have a post-quantum algorithm. We're not very confident in its security but maybe it's better than nothing. We have at least some hope that it will stay secure. So we could combine that algorithm with something which we know is broken by quantum computers, but which is secure today. So at least the new algorithm won't bring us new security problems. Um, and a, a, a very reasonable way to do this would be like combining X25519, which is kind of a modern elliptic curve handshake, and New Hope, which is one of these lattice-based schemes. Um, and this is what Google is currently trying out. So um, if you use an unstable version of Chrome currently and you surf to the Google Play Store, uh, you can see that it, it's using here on the right side something called CECPQ1, which stands for Combined Elliptic Curve Post Quantum. Um, so Google is already trying out to use uh, post-quantum key exchange combined with an elliptic curve key exchange in their browser. But they're currently saying like this is just an experiment. They don't want this to get widely deployed. They are just like, they want to try out what happens and they want to see, especially because these post-quantum schemes have these larger key exchanges, if that causes any problems. Um, and uh, the Tor project uh, also is currently playing with this and they have a thing they call Rebel Alliance, which is a, a draft for also to use a hybrid key exchange of these two key exchange mechanisms. Um, yeah. And now uh, I want to get to, so if you read like especially popular articles about quantum computing and all this stuff, you will see a lot of things that people get wrong or are very overhyped and I, I want to like, clarify a few things. So uh, I, I see a lot of uh, coverage where people think like, okay, quantum computing is kind of the next step of computing and uh, sometime in the future we will all have quantum computers in our laptops. Um, and I'm, I'm, I mean, it's hard to predict the future, that's obvious. But uh, I, I don't think it's very likely that this will happen. And the reason for that is that uh, a quantum computer is not something that can magically make everything much faster. They are only much faster for very specific algorithms. And the question is, is there anything that uh, an average user ever needs? Because like factoring large numbers, okay, this is nice if you want to break the encrypted emails from your neighbor maybe. Um, but, uh, okay, we will assume that in, in 10 years your neighbor will use a post-quantum encrypted email and 
then you can no longer do that. And, and the other thing is like simulating physics, which is uh, definitely interesting for researchers, but uh, probably also something you don't want to do at home. So uh, I could very well imagine that how this turns out is that we, we will not have quantum computers at home, uh, even if we would be able to do that, which is kind of an open question because it's already hard to build them at all. So uh, building them uh, like small scale and easy to maintain will be even harder. Uh, but it may, be, may not make any sense because uh, if there's no use case for an average user to use a quantum computer, uh, then nobody will sell them. And what I, I could imagine is that something happens that you can maybe rent quantum computing time at a university or some specialized company that has a quantum computer. Um, then there's um, this thing with D-Wave. So D-Wave is a company that says they have built a quantum computer um, but this is a different quantum computer from the one I was talking in this talk. And the I most important thing about it is it cannot run this Shor algorithm, so it cannot break crypto. So for the topic of cryptography, this is completely irrelevant. Um, and it's currently still even not clear if this computer can do anything at all that's interesting in any way. So they are currently like uh, researching this. They found that it can calculate some algorithm which is basically simulating itself faster than when you run the same algorithm on a classical computer. But uh, then someone else found out that they have, if you use another algorithm, you can do the same calculation even faster on a classical computer. So it's like kind of in the open if this is useful at all, but it's definitely not useful to break cryptography. And um, last I want to come to a topic which is so-called quantum cryptography, um, which gets a lot of hype and uh, I'm extremely skeptical if it has any value at all. Um, so I have to clarify the vocabulary here because this often gets confused and mixed together and it's not really clear if people talk about one thing or the other. So quantum computing, when we talk about quantum computing, this is okay, we have some device that's using quantum effects to do certain calculations faster. Um, and post-quantum cryptography is like all the cryptography that resists attacks with a quantum computer. Uh, quantum cryptography, on the other hand, or the more correct term is quantum key distribution, is that you use a physical channel by sending particles, uh, usually photons, to exchange a cryptographic key. Um, now, the idea behind that is that you're trying to build a crypto system which, whose security is based on the laws of physics. Because, so the argument goes somehow that, okay, if we build cryptography on math, we kind of cannot prove that this is secure, uh, which is due to some foundational information theoretical problems. Um, uh, but we, we trust that the laws of physics are correct, so we may be able to build a crypto system based on the laws of physics. Um, and what, they are, what this, these systems do is that you send a polarized particle and then um, you randomly choose a polarized filter to measure them and after that send the filter configuration to the other side. Um, and the idea why this is secure is that if an attacker tries to measure these polarized particles, he would destroy their state, which is due to uh, the Heisenberg law um, but um, th this has a lot of practical problems and I don't think it solves anything. Um, so uh, this has recently been a huge hype and especially like they, they came up this term quantum internet. Um, this is from an EU document, the EU quantum manifesto. Um, but there's even, there was a nature article about the upcoming quantum internet, um, which uh, takes us to a completely ridiculous um, point. Um, so um, if you look how these systems work, you very likely will have a limited distance. So you cannot just send a mail through a quantum cryptography system from, let's say, Europe to the US. Uh, you will have a limitation probably to a couple of dozen kilometers, maybe some hundreds if you're optimistic. Um, but uh, maybe this is a good thing, thought some people. Like, this is from the EU Quantum Manifesto. 
Um, and they say, yeah, oh, but they can only function over distances up to 300 kilometers. Um, and then they say, okay, instead repeaters based on trusted nodes, uh, possibly involving satellites, are needed to reach global distance. The advantage of trusted nodes scheme is that they provide access for lawful interception. Um, so, okay, uh, lawful interception is another term for state surveillance. Um, and I have tried to imagine what that means. Like, this is a map of the world. Um, I, I know someone from Sydney. Uh, we've been studying together, and occasionally I send him emails. Of course, we do this encrypted because we are both crypto nerds and know how to use PGP. Um, now, if I want to send a quantum encrypted email to him, then I would need trusted intermediate nodes roughly every 300 kilometers. So, like, um, I would have to need to have trusted intermediate nodes in Poland, Ukraine, Russia, Kazakhstan, China, India, Burma, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Australia. I, I'm not sure if I trust this encryption so much. Um, yeah, you get the point. Then another problem with this quantum internet is that we won't have wireless connections because you need this physical channel. You need some kind of a uh, fiber line or something where you can send these particles through. So the quantum internet will mean no Wi-Fi and no mobile internet. Um, and there's also such a thing as quantum hacking. So there are already companies that are selling devices for quantum cryptography and they get broken all the time. Um, and you're wondering, like, how is that possible? Because they said it's based on the laws of physics and we're reasonably confident that the laws of physics are correct. Um, now, the problem, like, you know, this problem between theory and practice, like, um, the, the, pr the security proofs for these devices assume basically a perfectly working device. But if you build a real device, you will have inaccuracies, you have, will have some behavior that was not part of your security model. Um, so, they are secure if you have an idealized version of a quantum key distribution system, but they are not secure in any real system. And um, if you think, uh, okay, if you, if you put your cryptography into a, a hardware device, then like, okay, if we have a bug in the encryption software, okay, that's bad, but then we install an update. If we have a bug in our encryption hardware, we can throw it away and buy a new one. Um, yeah, so, and now, but I, th I think even though even if we consider all these things, I think this is like the, the most important aspect of this. And this is uh, all these quantum key distribution schemes assume that you already have an authenticated channel, which is where you send the configuration of your polarization filters. And um, this authenticated channel, you, you need to somehow build it. And, and how do you build authentication? Okay, with cryptography, of course. Now, you could use some symmetric authentication scheme like HMAC, but that would mean you would need to have an exchange key in advance, uh, which also means you could also use just AES, uh, which is also secure against quantum computers. So it, it doesn't bring you any advantage against a quantum computer. Or you could use a, a norm signature scheme like RSA, but then, I mean, then it doesn't help against quantum computers either because RSA is broken by quantum computers. So I think this is a very significant limitation, a fundamental limitation of these systems that tends to get forgotten if, if people talk about this. Um, um, but uh, that especially means that uh, even if you could overcome all these practical problems, these devices are still not a solution against quantum computers. Um, and that was uh, also stated in, in 2004 in a paper by Kenny Patterson and others where, where they say it's a well-established fact that all QKE protocols require that parties have access to an authenticated channel. Um, overlooking this fact results in its exaggerated claims and or false expectations about the potential of quantum key exchange. Um, I think this basically nails the problem. This was uh, 12 years ago. Um, So, yeah, quantum cryptography, it's extremely overhyped with outrageous claims like a quantum internet. Um, it's entirely unclear what problem they are trying to solve. Some of them are saying they do this against quantum computers, but it doesn't really help against quantum computers. 
And the solution to protect against quantum computers is post-quantum cryptography. Um, yeah, and so the conclusion of my talk, um, quantum computers may come pretty soon, or maybe they will not come at all, we don't know, but we should be prepared. Um, and post-quantum cryptography is still kind of in its early research stages, so you could argue we are already too late, because if quantum computers come in 10 years, then we would have need to start the transition like five years ago. Um, and uh, be very skeptical about overhyped claims about so-called quantum cryptography. Yeah. Um, some more information. There's a web page, pqcrypto.org, and there's also a yearly conference. Um, and there's the mentioned EU research project. Um, and also the NIST, which is the US standardization authority. They're currently discussing a process how they should standardize post-quantum cryptography. So if you want to take part in that discussion, they have a mailing list where you can sign up. And yeah, I'm open for questions. So, who has questions? Was good enough in math and physics to understand it? It's always hard to prove that something is secure because you just usually yeah. just prove that you just know that it's breakable right now. In terms of this post quantum, uh, how do you argue or prove or rationalize why this algorithm is safe against po against quantum attacks and the other one is not? Yeah. Just because you know for that one an algorithm that works and for other you don't you don't yeah. know an algorithm yet that so would work with quantum computers or is there more theoretical background to be sure that this is safe? So, I mean, there's a very general thing that we cannot prove cryptographic algorithms to be secure. That can be, uh, that you, you can kind of show that this is the case because we don't have a solution for the PNP problem, which then goes into theoretical computer science. But it, it's in general, at least with current knowledge, impossible to prove that cryptography is secure. So we always rely on the fact that we say, okay, this has been out for so many years and many smart people looked at it and tried to break it and nobody found a flaw. And um, what you can do additionally is you can sometimes argue, okay, we can reduce this problem to some very well understood mathematical problem. And this has uh, maybe the crypto system is new, but the underlying mathematics is much older and you can argue, okay, mathematicians have thought about this for a much longer time and they think they understand this very well and if they say, okay, we have no way of doing this in a fast way, then it's maybe secure. But uh, the important about this is this is true for both. Uh, it doesn't matter if you put in a quantum computer. These fundamental facts are true for, for all crypto systems. Um, yes, but is there any, any way to prove that this problem is same hard with quantum and with classical computation? Um, or you can't prove no, it either? No, you cannot do it. So ju just to follow up on that point, uh, some of these forms of post-quantum crypto, such as lattices or elliptic curve isogenies, uh, are people doing research to try to, or doing active research to try to find quantum algorithms to break these crypto systems? Is, yeah. is that an active field of research? Yeah. So there have been, I don't know the name, but there have been recommendations for post-quantum algorithms that have been thrown away because they could not be broken with a classical computer, but they could be broken with a quantum computer. So this field of research is definitely, this is happening. So, I mean, other than Shor's algorithm, have people found new quantum algorithms? Um, so there's a Grover's algorithm, which you can use to attack symmetric schemes and reduce them to their square root. But other than that, not. So, um, I, I mean, uh, there are not that many quantum algorithms that have been found yet. Okay, um, a different question. If quantum key exchange is such a waste of time, how come the Chinese government is spending so many billions of dollars on it? Um, that's a good question. The EU is also spending many billions of 
dollars on it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, um, uh, I feel. Uh, I mean, it seems that this is a very persu persuasive story. So people tend to believe like this. Oh, quantum computers, and we need to protect with quantum cryptography. Sounds very plausible. It is not plausible. Um, so, it, it, yeah, I mean, if, if, if I would be mean, I would say, okay, this is researchers that want research money and they are very successful in selling their case. <laughs> you kind of took away my question. I was just uh, going to ask why post-quantum cryptography doesn't get the same research funds as quantum cryptography where it can buy satellites for space communication or build yeah. fiber optic lines through the Pacific and stuff like that. I think it's just a very posh research field in general, and a lot of f uh, physicists want to want, want to do research and get grants because it sounds very sophisticated, and only a few yeah. people actually understand it. I have no idea why the, why the EU has such a big big budget for that, but not for actual um, crypto algorithms that would be useful on the mm. internet or not on. I, I mean, what has to be said is that the field of post quantum cryptography is very new, and this idea of quantum communication over five, this is much older, this, I, I think it goes back to the 80s. And post-quantum cryptography has only, like, I think the term was coined somewhere in 2006, and it's only been really an active research topic in the past two or three years. <laughs>